Hi everyone, so it's a year into this pandemic and social distancing and weirdness and, and at least it's spring, which I absolutely love. It is my favorite time of year, so I'm super excited. We're still, um, you know, locking down and it's frustrating, but at least there's hope on the horizon in a number of ways. I've been quite busy the last couple months starting a new job, which I'm doing from home, which was quite a random opportunity. Um, so I'm happy about that for sure, but it has made me have to sort of get into that nine to five routine of just like getting up, exercising, going to work, cooking, sleeping, that's kind of it. So I'm happy to be back shooting a video because I haven't done it in so long and I just absolutely love shooting videos. Today I wanna to talk about a very rare compression syndrome called median arcuate ligament syndrome or MALS, also known as Dunbar syndrome, celiac artery compression syndrome or Harjola marable syndrome. I talked before in one of my videos, the PTSD, medical PTSD video, on having these symptoms of chronic pancreatitis with acute pancreatic attacks and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI. And when I spoke recently to a doctor in Germany, which is where I had to go, I didn't, sorry, I didn't go to Germany, but I, I had a video consult with this doctor. In talking with this doctor in Germany, he did tell me that he feels the chronic inflammation in my pancreas and the symptoms that I'm having of the pain, the bloating, the pain after eating, the pain with the exercise, the pancreatic insufficiency is being caused by this. I'm gonna go over a couple of the symptoms that you could experience with median arcuate ligament syndrome. Keep in mind that it would vary from person to person greatly, and it varies from day to day even greatly. So some of the symptoms include upper abdominal pain after eating, it's probably the biggest one, upper abdominal fullness after eating small amounts or drinking, distension after eating, especially in the upper abdomen, nausea and or vomiting, weight loss, trouble breathing and chest pains, abdominal pain with exercise, possibly chronic diarrhea, varicose veins on the abdomen, and lymphedema. MELS is a condition that is generally congenital, but not necessarily. It can also happen after accidents or just kind of more spontaneously, Or you, but most likely you've had the compression and just the symptoms themselves sort of generated over time. The doctor that I saw does believe that scoliosis and a pronounced lumbar lordosis, that's the your lower spine, um, being hyperextended can cause or exacerbate a lot of this. And often what you'll see is over time, even decades, it will slowly progress and get worse and worse. You usually have a huge amount of testing done before anybody even considers MELS, and not that you can't necessarily find it on a CT scan, although it does have to be a specific type of CT and it, has to, and it doesn't always show on that either. But usually people go through a huge battery of tests to come to the conclusion that maybe this is happening, and even then a lot of the times it just kind of ends with psychiatric. Some of the tests can include endoscopies, colonoscopies, gastric emptying scans, barium swallows, H. pylori testing, regular CT scans, ultrasounds, MRIs, endoscopic ultrasounds, liver and pancreatic enzyme testing, anal manometry tests, and psychiatric assessments. They'll also check for celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease through biopsies. Now this is not a hard and fast rule like every single illness on the planet, but the more common people to experience MELS are thin young women and usually between the ages of I would say like 20 to 45 or so. Um, this is just kind of like what they've studied but again this is a rare condition. I have seen online men who have this in different circumstances, different people of different ages including older men so again not a hard and fast rule but MELS is also seen a lot, off, a lot more often in people with scoliosis and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome because of the crappy tissue and the crappy ligaments that we have. What MELS essentially is, is a compression of the celiac artery from the median arcuate ligament. So that's compressing on the celiac artery and also pressing on a bundle of nerves that supply the, um, the nerves to all of the organs in your upper abdomen. So the pancreas, the gallbladder, your intestines, your stomach, 
things like that. And in chronic pancreatitis, this is also what is affected, and so the differentiation between chronic pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, and MELS is actually really difficult to pull apart, especially when it does become a chronic issue. And also especially because both of those conditions are very rare and because MELS can actually cause chronic pancreatitis. And actually the surgery for MELS can provoke acute pancreatitis, which can then turn into chronic. MELS can happen in waves where it kind of comes off and on to some degree. Usually it's always there, but there's some uh, severity difference and it can be quite huge um, for me and again I'm not diagnosed with MELS right I still need that diagnosis but like everything just is making sense right so let's just consider the fact that maybe I have MELS so even if I didn't the people that I've spoken to who have MELS have the same situation so they're um, and same with chronic pancreatitis so again really hard to differentiate and you know who knows how my story is gonna go but for MELS it can fluctuate in terms of that severity for weeks you could be pretty much okay and think, oh, everything's fine, and then just be hit really, really hard again with those symptoms, or it could just be consistent. MELS is often seen with other compression syndromes. Usually people don't just have one, but the treatment for one of them can actually set off other ones that you didn't have symptoms of pre-surgery. In order to treat MELS, you need to have a surgery. There's really no other way around it, and it is quite a drastic surgery. There are a couple ways that surgeons do it. One of them will be to cut from the sternum down to the belly button and do an open, and, and other surgeons do laparoscopy or robotic surgeries. You do need somebody who is a vascular surgeon and very, very skilled and understands MELS and has done them before. Doctors are very reluctant to either do this surgery or or recommend it because of a number of reasons. The veins are very delicate and it can be risky and a lot. it takes a lot of precision. The other reason is because it can cause a relapse afterwards for a variety of reasons. So one of them can be um, just general risks. So the risks are embolism, recompression for things like scar tissue can recompress or you, your body can simply just anatomically does not want to stay in that position. Sometimes stents are used to try to keep the arteries open and apparently the States does the surgery very differently for from Europe and Canada, uh, just don't even get me started. <laughs> Canada is just, there There are a few doctors here who do it, but they don't have a good success rate. They tell you they don't have a good success rate and I've never even been able to see one because they wouldn't even look at my scans. A lot of doctors don't believe there's a good success rate with the surgery, but the ones that are more skilled in it believe that there's a higher rate. Again, that's debatable when you look at the patients who actually have experiences. They kind of, it is sort of a, not a shot in the dark, but it's definitely, you know, not a, I don't know if it's 50-50, I think it's more than a 50-50 chance of, of getting better with the right doctor, but not everyone gets better. My symptoms were a pretty slow progression, which, and I, I am talking decades, I've had symptoms off and on of this, but getting worse and worse as the years went on. So that's why, one of the reasons why I feel like it's not just chronic pancreatitis or that there's something causing that chronic pancreatitis that's related to the EDS, which that was like, I was racking my brain trying to figure out how the hell is this connected to the EDS. And when I talked to that doctor in Germany, it just like answered literally all my questions about every other single problem that I was having. Having, not just the upper abdominal pain and the nausea and the diarrhea like it just it answered everything it was like my uh, extreme period pain and the fact that it never got it got somewhat better in some specific ways after endometriosis removal but not in the ways that everybody else with endometriosis removal were getting benefit and I just could not figure out why and it also explained my breathing trouble like I've been talking about and like even my stuffy nose in the morning sorry my phone was just going off even my stuffy nose in the morning to like just the weirdest stuff he was just like it would just explain so many different random things that I did not think were connected and this is not just mouths this is like we talked about my like the fact that I probably have like very specific compression syndromes based on my symptoms. Like it even, we even talked about my chronic kidney stones and how that is related, which like I thought that's just like, that's not related at all. Like they're oxalate stones, but 
why was I having them? Do you know what I mean? And like, I wasn't, I, I would keep going to my nephrologist and we would keep having these discussions about like what I should eat and what I should drink. And every like few months I do a 24 hour urine with like blood work and ultrasounds for years. Like we've been doing this. And most of the time he says, you're doing great. You're doing everything you can. I don't see any high oxalates in your system. And yet I'm just pushing out like, 10 kidney stones a month sometimes. And I'm like, why is this happening? And he's like, I don't know. And then the doctor explained it, like the doctor in Germany. And I'm like, what? Mind blown. <laughs> so like I said in one of my other videos, my medical PTSD video, I did talk about the symptoms that I've been having. I do believe I am having chronic pancreatitis still. So that's, I just wanna like put that out there that I think the symptoms are just like sort of all combining together. But I think it's coming from that mouth and the mouth symptoms are this burning, pain at my where my diaphragm is so like just under my breasts where my diaphragm is it's like aching burning fullness like a pressure that's like constantly there especially when i eat it like it's way way worse it's like when you have a four course meal at like thanksgiving and you just you feel so awful like you just feel like oh my god i i cannot eat another bite like i feel really bad like I'm so uncomfortable that's what it feels like all the time even if I've just had like today I have not eaten a lot it's like two three in the afternoon and I've only had like a bowl of cereal and like two homemade cookies and like I am like I'm having that Thanksgiving dinner feeling which is just like ridiculous because that shouldn't really be happening and it will happen if I have water even like just anything that's going into my stomach just doesn't seem to be like moving through properly even though I've had a gastric emptying study and it like it was fine like I mean I wasn't able to finish the whole meal so I guess technically it wasn't like I haven't you know it wasn't solid but like it's just really difficult to eat. And the other thing I'll have is attacks of like really sharp pain in my left upper abdomen. I do get the sharp pain elsewhere as well. I get stitches in my side, especially on the left. And that's like lower down. I'll also get sharp pains throughout my abdomen that I'm starting to like increasingly get. That almost feels like IBS, but just worse, which is like crazy because IBS is so bad. Like people don't really understand how painful and debilitating IBS is. So when I say it's worse than the IBS pain I've had in my life, it's that like that's really big. So another symptom that I have is nausea and I never basically ever vomit if my whole family gets a wicked flu and they're vomiting profusely, I will not vomit. And with this, I know that nausea, nausea and vomiting, vomiting especially is a big hallmark. It is with gastroparesis as well. It is with pancreatitis. Now I did mention that there are some other compression syndromes and I'll talk about that in a minute. My next steps are gonna be to fly to Germany to get a diagnosis and then to also have a consult that I'm scheduling right now with the surgeon that the doctor who diagnoses talks to and collaborates with to do the surgery because the, the doctor that I diagnoses is not the doctor who does the vascular surgery. Um, and usually that's the case for mouth. Usually you see somebody who specializes in ultrasonography or radiology and um, they diagnose the condition and then you go to see a vascular surgeon who would do the treatment. So not an exhaustive list by any means of what compression syndromes and mouths can cause, but some of the side effects include starvation, obviously, trouble da with daily activities, trouble breathing to the point of like in intubation. And then of course, uh, organ dysfunction and tissue death where parts of you know some of your organs may need to be removed at some point and this is I'm talking more so with things like SMAS which like we're gonna talk about in just a second all right so a list of the other compression syndromes here we go I'll just add mal's in here because that is a compression syndrome so median arcuate ligament syndrome lordogenic midline congestion syndrome nutcracker syndrome or lordogenic left renal vein compression syndrome may Thurner syndrome Cockett syndrome, midline congestion syndrome, pelvic congestion syndrome, and superior mesenteric artery syndrome, also known as Wilkie syndrome. So how do you get diagnosed with MELS? Well, uh, there's a few tests that they can do. One of them is a functional color Doppler ultrasound which is also great for diagnosing other compression syndromes. Another one is a CT or MRI angiogram. And another one that's kind of, yeah, I guess frequently used by some surgeons is a celiac plexus block. So let's talk about the treatments again. I know I mentioned that 
surgery was really the only way to treat it. That's true in terms of curing it, but it can be treated with also feeding tubes and ports, as well as pain medication, celiac plexus blocks, and there are, there's a couple physiotherapy exercises that I found. Again, this will not cure it, but I have found a few. I'm gonna link them down below. I did try them out with my physio and they were okay. If you do get surgery with somebody, make sure that you do your research on them, of course, and ask them a lot of questions. It's a pretty major surgery. That's what I'm kind of in the process of right now. Um, talk to other patients as well. Like that's always a great idea. You can go online to different forums and just, you know, see if there's anybody else dealing with this and who they've seen and see if you can get any suggestions from them. Another suggestion of mine is if you do end up getting the surgery, remember that you need to keep in mind your rehab, right? So ask the doctor about that. Talk to a physiotherapist prior, I think, before actually doing the surgery and let them know what the surgery entails. And I would definitely incorporate in as part of like the rehabilitation, not only physiotherapy, but also the Things like deep tissue mobilization, massage, or self myo um, doesn't have to be self, but myofascial release therapy, as well as possibly seeing a pelvic physio. Because you keep in mind everything's connected, especially with the diaphragm and the pelvis. But just in general, that whole area, your torso is going to be greatly affected, and that's going to affect everything else in your body, right? So that's it for my Mel's video and story. And I hope that you learned something out of this. I didn't even know that this was an issue or like a condition um, until about maybe like six months to a year ago. So hopefully if you're struggling and you haven't found an answer, maybe this is it, who knows? Share your story down below if you do have this compression syndrome or any other compression syndromes because the more that we talk about it, the more that it's known to the medical community eventually. Just because people start talking about it more and who knows what kind of you know doctors or medical students might stumble across this, right? Thank you so much for being here today, for watching my video, for making it this far. I hope that you enjoy your spring and I'll see you next time.